I'm a full professor of psychology with particular interest in transpersonal psychology. I originally trained as a child psychologist and then went on from there, trained in psychotherapy and I've been an academic and research psychologist for many years. I've always been interested in paranormal research. I'm often asked why I became interested in it. I can't remember a time in my life when I've not been interested in it. The paranormal is that mysterious area behind the seen and the known world. And since most of the world is unseen and unknown and most of the world is full of mystery, for me it's a fascinating and absorbing area. And it links in, of course, with the whole question of survival and the nature of mind. Answer the question, who are we? What is our real nature? Are we just a biological accident? Is there more to it than that? Do we live life without meaning and die without hope? Or is there some much broader spectrum within which we're a part? The Society for Psychical Research, or SPR for short, was set up in 1882. In fact, it's the oldest scientific society in the world devoted to exploring the paranormal. And by that we mean those faculties of man which cannot be explained under known laws. We've had 12 Nobel Prize winners as members. We've had many fellows of the Royal Society. Some of the finest scientists in Britain, in fact, have been members. And many scientists from America have also been members. I've always been interested, within the context of the paranormal, in mediumship because clearly a mediumship provides a channel, or a supposed channel, between this world and the next. Physical mediumship is a particular area of mediumship and it has the advantage in that what you see is fairly objective. In other words, all the investigators should see the same thing and, within reasonable limits, agree upon what they see. The Society for Psychical Research has been investigating physical mediumship on and off for over 100 years. We got involved in Skoll, which is one of the best cases, although I've had many other experiences of physical phenomena. We got involved with Skoll as a result of invitation, and for two years, uh, once a month, we had sittings there with a the group. It consisted of four people. There were two mediums who were in trance, and the two organisers, and then the three experimenters from the SPR, myself and two colleagues, all highly experienced investigators, all trained scientists. By the time I investigated Skoll, I'd had many other experiences. If I hark back very briefly to my first experience, which was that of a poltergeist case, poltergeist haunting. Poltergeists are supposedly noisy, mischievous spirits, and you get a great deal of stone throwing, and things are broken, and so on. And I investigated a case of this kind for two years and saw much of the phenomena myself. And it changed my paradigm. While I was there, I thought it could not possibly be explained by normal means. I got in the car, halfway home, I thought, this is rubbish, this is nonsense. You don't get things thrown around like that. But as I investigated that case and went further and further and deeper and deeper into it, I gradually became convinced that it was genuine. I even observed phenomena when I was in the building on my own, so there was no question of trickery of any kind. So by the time I got to Skoll, I'd also had sittings with other physical groups and so on, so I was pretty sure that if we could eliminate normal explanations, such as fraud, for example, then the phenomena would probably be genuine, because one could not mistake what we saw. We saw coloured lights, we saw materialisations, we had direct voices, that is, spirit voices talking from the air, apparently, we, we were touched by the spirits. We saw a whole range of phenomena which could not be mistaken by three investigators such as ourselves. We saw materialisations and dematerialisations. We saw hands materialised just up to the wrist, silhouetted in the very bright lights which the spirits, let's call them that for want of a better term, brought with them. And on one occasion we were asked to put a Pyrex bowl on the table in the seance room to place one of the crystals in the bowl. We did this as investigators. One of the small lights then appeared to go into the crystal and illuminate it brightly from within. We were told to put our hands in the Pyrex bowl and feel how solid the crystal was. We did this. We were then told to take our hands out, feel the crystal again. It still was visually there, but in fact our fingers went right through it. We were told it had dematerialized. We were then told to take our hands out and then replace them and the crystal was again solid. Now, it sounds, of course, as if some trickery was involved, but since our, our hands were over the bowl all this time, there was no way in which the crystal could have been taken out and substituted or anything of that kind. I know that there are devices, trick devices, which apparently levitate objects. We know the whole range of these phenomena. Skeptics are often unaware of the amount of experience and the amount of knowledge that goes into investigations of this kind. Between the three investigators, you could say we'd had 50 years and more of experiences of this kind. We know all the tricks and in fact we had a conjurer, a member of the inner magic circle, 
as one of the people who sat with this group, uh, James Webster. And his opinion, his professional opinion, was that there was no way in which any conjurer could have duplicated the phenomena that we saw there. In addition, of course, we were able to search the room thoroughly beforehand, search the room thoroughly afterwards, and so on. It's very important to have a magician at these investigations, because although scientists know the science and they know the tricks, they don't actually uh, do the tricks themselves. You need a magician there who's done the tricks, who knows the circumstances under which he can get results, and the circumstances which would prevent him from getting results. Now, we were very fortunate. James Webster, who's a silver medal holder of the Inner Magic Circle, which is the main group of magicians in Britain, had sittings with the Skoll group. And in his professional opinion, there was no way in which any magician could duplicate the effects that he saw there, even if they were given access to the room beforehand and were able to bring in all their own equipment and so on. Spirit lights are one of the most interesting phenomena at physical circles of that kind, and they generally take uh, three forms. You have very small lights which dart around the room at great speed and cannot be duplicated by LEDs being swung around on long threads or anything of that nature, or carbon fibres or what have you. Then there are larger lights which do similar things but are the size of, let's say, marbles, quite large marbles. And then there are diffused patches of light which would be very, very difficult to explained by normal means. You can project a light onto a wall, but you can't project it readily in the air and float around and, at our invitation, come towards us or move away from us. And those diffuse patches of light would sometimes materialise into hooded forms, robed forms, robed figures, on the table in front of us a few inches away. We were even allowed to invite them to come very close to us. And then they would go up to the ceiling and then they would disappear. On other occasions, the diffuse patches of light would take the form just of a human face, moving round the room with the direct voice, very, very faintly, coming from the diffuse patch of light and the, the lips moving again very faintly. In the case of Skoll, we had a quite a, an unusual example of matter through matter, in that the small lights would sometimes hit the table with an, an audible sound and then appear instantaneously underneath the table. Now, this was a fraud-proof table, which means that it was blocked underneath the table. So nobody could get under the table, crawl around under the table, the two mediums, nobody could get under the table and do this. And they, the light would materialise again near the legs, let's say, of Monty Keane, one of my fellow investigators, Arthur Ellison or myself, in areas which were inaccessible to the mediums or the other two members of the Skoll group. The lights also had another rather strange trick up their sleeve, if I may talk about lights as having sleeves, and that was to pass through bodies so that the, the light would strike the body and next moment would exit from the body. Now, I, of course, because I'm always up for these things, I invited it to come and try this on me. I wanted to see what would happen. The, the light hit me and um, with, I didn't feel a thing. The light disappeared. And next moment, from inside the palm of my hand, I felt slight pressure from inside just like the pressure that the light exerted if it landed on the outside of my palm. And next moment, the light had exited from my body. Again, the, these things are so extraordinary that when one tells them to people who've not had the experiences themselves, they think, oh, it must be trickery. And the challenge then always is, OK, you duplicate it. We threw out the challenge, we've maintained it throughout. We will give every assistance to any magician who wishes to come and duplicate those phenomena under those conditions in the presence of investigators and in the presence of James Webster, who actually saw the genuine phenomena. Now, these were great experiences, you see. I, I, again, I must stress, it changes your paradigm. You go in thinking none of this can be true, but after experience, after experience, after experience, it gradually dawns on you, hey, there's something going on here that we can't explain by normal scientific laws, but which nevertheless, nevertheless exists. And of course, it links in very strongly with survival, again because we were told in, in all these sittings with the Skoll group and with the other groups that I've sat with, that it was, I don't like the term, it was the spirits who were doing this. And of course they were communicating through the mediums, we were able to hold conversations with the mediums, we were able to request certain kinds of phenomena, and they actually would produce it to order. The experiences that I've had have convinced me that it is very difficult to explain any of these things by an alternative explanation to that of survival. And of course, when you're working with mediums, good mediums, and there are a lot that aren't very good, you have to search pretty hard to find a good medium. Many of them very well-meaning, but they're not that good. When you work with a good medium, these are professional people who are actually channeling supposedly discarnate spirits. Now, they know far more about it, in a sense, than investigators like myself, who are just sitting there observing what is going on. 
Now, I could go in with all sorts of grandiose theories of my own and try and tell mediums that the experiences that they have are not what they think they are, but there are grave dangers in that, just as there are in the rest of psychology. You try to dictate to people and say that you know their experiences better than they know them themselves. So, from the point of view of mediums, the answer to the question is clear. Survival is a fact and people are communicating. Now, when they can communicate information which is not in the mind of the sitter, so there's no question of telepathy from the mind of the sitter, going to the mind of the medium and being given back to you as an apparent spirit, and when you can rule out the fact that other people somewhere in the world might know the information that you're given, then it does sound very, very much as if it comes from the discarnate person who claims to be communicating. It's the simplest explanation in many ways, and science on the whole likes the explanation that fits the facts best and that is simplest. Now, you, you can demolish the theory, if you like, by saying, I don't believe in survival anyway. But then that's a closed mind, and scientists should not have closed minds. We should go into all these things with an open mind, which means we look at the evidence, and then we try to draw certain conclusions or form certain hypotheses on the basis of the evidence. Conditioned in the afterlife, as we understand them, again, through communications, through ITC communications, through communications through medium, are that the lower levels of the afterlife are very much like this world but that they are, in a sense, a world of thought, just as we know that we are co-creators of this world from the atomic flux, which is the real nature, if you like, of, of material reality in this world. So in the next world, the mind of the observer, the consciousness of the observer, helps to create the experience. So at the lower levels of the next world, it does seem as if it is very much like this world. Either this world is a copy of the next world, or the next world is a copy of this world. But, of course, we're always told that there are various different levels of the next world and that eventually one moves into a, an area which is a formless area, that, that you go beyond form, you go beyond physical form and exist as some form of pure consciousness. Actually, it all sounds rather like fun, which is, which is not a bad thing. <laughs>